Welcome to the We Are Guitar broadcast. I'm your host, Brad Richter. I'm also the executive director of Lead Guitar, a not-for-profit that builds free guitar programs in public schools nationwide. I'm coming to you from Guitar Salon International headquarters here in Santa Monica, California, and I'm surrounded by some amazing guitars on the walls here, which is pretty cool if you're a guitar geek like me. We've got a fantastic show for you. Our guest is Molly Miller, one of LA's most sought after musicians, guitarist for the Black Eyed Peas and Jason Mraz, and chair of the guitar department of Los Angeles College of Music. Molly will be performing Jason Mraz's hit, Making It Up, with lead guitar students around the country in a virtual ensemble, and helping us celebrate two outstanding student soloists. We'll also hear a guitar orchestra performance by the Guitar Foundation of America Youth Ensemble, directed by our friend Chuck Houlihan. You want to have your guitar ready for the second half of the show. We'll give you everything you need to join in the virtual ensemble with Molly, and we'll have a mini master class with Professor Dennis Azabagic, who will give us some advice about strumming without a pick. But first, let's kick things off with a short video from lead guitar students in California and Colorado, talking about why guitar is important to them and who they most like to play for in a segment we're calling Sound Off. Guitar is important to me because it teaches me how to play music. It is fun to do, and I love playing it for my family. I love playing the guitar because I really enjoy it, and I want my whole family to be happy for me, too, because I am learning how to play, and yeah. And playing guitar is important to me because I think it's fun. I like playing guitar because my family supports me on it. Lead guitar is important to me because it's something fun you can do and not so hard. It's everybody can do it and not just one person. I love playing the guitar for myself, family, and class. I love playing the guitar for myself because I get to try new things and I can improve my knowledge on the guitar. I love playing the guitar for my family and class because they can help me improve and I can show them what I learned. I like guitar because you get to express yourself and meet many new people and have a great mentor. Playing guitar is important to me because it is a really cool instrument. It plays really cool sounds. And maybe in the future, I can play a lot of songs and maybe even play electric guitar. I like playing guitar for myself. And I like playing guitar because it's fun. <laughs> guitar is important to me because I don't feel like I have an obligation to play guitar like some instruments. Um, I just really enjoy playing it. And playing guitar is important to me because I like to feel challenged and the music that I play and that I learn is challenging and it allows me to grow and learn from my mistakes. I play guitar for my family and my friends. And guitar is important to me because it's fun and when I play it for my family it makes them happy and I like making people happy. Well, that was really sweet. I loved that. Um, I think my favorite was Rodolfo saying, I like to play guitar for myself. Just simple and pure. I know that's kind of not what we expected. What did you think of that, Tomek? Oh, that was amazing. Yeah, and the, and the girl that had, her, had the frame so that the, the camera was right at the bottom of her chin. Anyway, that's cute stuff, and we're going to do that every show. Um, so before we meet Molly Miller, I want to share this truly exceptional performance with you by the Guitar Foundation of America Youth Ensemble. This is a group that gathers each summer as part of the GFA International Convention and produces some top-notch performances with only a few days rehearsal. So here's Chuck Houlihan conducting, con uh, excuse me, conducting Tango Argentino by Annette Kruisbrink. <laughs> Thank you. 
wow, that's really amazing playing. And uh, Chuck has such energy when he conducts. I don't know how, can, how you can not play with it. And this move, you know, to, to get them to play forte is awesome. Um, anyway, uh, so lead guitar students, if that looks fun to you too, let your instructor know and we'll find a way to try to help get you to that GFA convention so you can participate in the ensemble too. It's, it's very, very cool. What an experience. So um, it's time now to bring out our guest Molly. Um, I've really been enjoying getting to know the broad spectrum of her work from a jazz guitarist, pop guitarist, rock guitarist. Um, let's check out uh, this brief footage of her playing uh, with Jason Mraz in a giant stadium somewhere with uh, thousands of screaming fans. It's pretty cool. What a great clip. Molly, welcome to the show. We're so glad to have you with us. Thank you for having me, Brad. It's great to be here. You're sure welcome. So we just watched a clip of you playing with Jason in Brazil at a big music festival. And you must have had, I don't know, it's uh, dozens of thousands of people screaming as you were playing that guitar solo. What does that feel like for those of us who have fantasized about being a rock star? There is a ton of energy. It's so fun, but it's funny. Like a friend was just asking me about the difference because I do a lot of gigs. You know, I'll play these big, fun, rock starry kind of shows, and then I'll play at a like a wine bar that has twelve people listening, or like what you know, like so. Um, but it's not like I even think like one's really necessarily all that different. It's it's all the same. It's like I'm showing up. I'm playing music. And either the, the energy from the audience on stage is illuminating us and we're helping to illuminate them, it's still the same exchange. Uh, but obviously it's fun to play for tons of people. But it's almost more like just to, to say it, not necessarily, I don't know. Now I'm going back and forth. It's incredible. I'm not going to lie. It's so much fun. The energy is insane. But also I'll have the same adrenaline rush that I get from a, a show like that from just like a great show at a club in L.A., well, I, I used to be a, a touring guitarist, and um, I, I felt the same way that uh, playing for, you know, seven people in a, in a restaurant didn't feel much different than playing for, you know, a large crowd in a concert hall that, that was there to see me. But I never played for that, that mass of screaming fans. So one last question about that. What was it like the very first time you did it? Oh, my gosh. I, I mean, it's... You work so hard for something and it's kind of crazy when it finally happens. I definitely have those moments all the time when I'm out playing on the playing on the road and even like things like this. It, it's so cool to have people reach out to me and, and want me to be involved in what they're doing. Um, it's humbling is the truth. It's like really exciting, really thrilling and also very humbling and makes me just want to keep working hard to keep having these really gratifying experiences. Well, you've been working hard for a long time, and, and you know, I noticed reading your biography and getting to know you a little bit through your videos and, and, and through what I could read about you. So you graduated from USC with your doctorate in 2016, and then it seemed like lightning fast, you were one of the, the first call guitarists in LA, toughest city in the world to, to, to be a studio and, and gigging musician in. And uh, I was just thinking, you know, so, so one, guitar can be a little bit of a boys club. So a as you made it up that quickly, did you find, did you have extra obstacles uh, that you had to overcome? Or did you find you had to work harder than everybody else um, because of the boys club factor? Yeah, I mean, there's two answers to that. One is as a woman, I do feel like I get certain opportunities, um, which I feel grateful for. But at the same time, it's absolutely a boys club. And... I don't think it's necessarily healthy, but I think it's kind of a, a means to get through it is I, I kind of push that aside. I just, I show up to my gigs. I don't, I don't, I don't think about being a woman like, because I want to be treated just like everyone else. And so sometimes mostly from the outside world, 
I'll get comments that are super frustrating. And what I've kind of realized is I think I just have to make my boundaries more clear. I have to make it, um, I have to work a little harder to let everyone know why I'm there and what my job is. And there's definitely, it's a complicated thing to navigate um, of how people are going to treat you and how you're seen. I think a lot of people expect you as a woman to show up and not know how to play your instrument. So I definitely feel like I'm like, every time I go to a gig, it's not just for me, but it's for everyone, for all women to be like, no, like, I'm not going to be worse because I'm a woman. And so it makes me want to work harder. And I definitely have plenty of frustrating experiences that I could, I could go on about. But that's not the center of my experience is just the truth. It's like, yes, I, I always think like, I'm a guitarist. And yeah, I happen to be a woman. And I feel like that's my mentality. And I try to try to live like that. So other people will see me like that. Well, as successful as as you've been, I'm hoping that's not an issue. Well, that that, that issue is fading. You know, the, the, that that uh, uh, Molly Miller is just Molly Miller, the amazing guitarist, and it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, I was just a part of this really cool thing for jazz guitar to, for jazz guitar today. This great magazine, Beth Marlis, who's a wonderful guitarist and educator, put together this article of six women that are all chairs of guitar departments across the country and even in Canada. And it was so cool. So we did the Zoom yesterday and it was really powerful to be like one of six women who are like leading the guitar, like higher education of guitar. Um, so I do think things are changing. Frustrations aren't going to stop. It's not like overnight. It's suddenly going to be like everyone treats everyone equally. But um, I do feel a shift in the tide. I do too. I do too. Um, so one last question before we bring our first student soloist on. Um, what, you know, as a chair of the guitar department at Los Angeles College of Music, what do you look for in young musicians coming to study music in college, coming to study guitar in college? And of course, I ask this because we've got a ton of, of high school kids who might be interested in studying music watching. Yeah, I think just the seriousness for the instrument, because uh, I always say like the tortoise wins the race, not the hare. It's not like if you show up and you're like, you can play the fastest and play the best. It's like, it's really this progression of showing up every day and wanting to evolve on your instrument is definitely what I'm looking for. And of course, some basic skill sets, but you need drive to just grow and be ready for the roller coaster and, and see it kind of as fun and not something that's so daunting. Does that make sense? Yeah. It does make sense. Yeah. And if it's not fun for you, it's not going to turn out as, like, the way you wanted when you study music in college. Uh, you know, it has to be your thing. Yeah. You just have to want to every day show up and explore on the guitar and want to grow because no matter what you do, it's challenging, whether you're a guitar player or not. Um, but I think with this instrument, you have to, or with any instrument, you have to be really ready for, for the long, long haul. All right. Well, on the theme of kids who might go to college to study music, let's introduce our first student soloist. This is Andrew Adams from Camelback High School in Phoenix, and he's playing etude in A minor by Maruo Giuliani. And for those of you looking for this piece, it's in Lead Guitar Book Two, right near the beginning. All right, let's roll Andrew. <laughs> was fantastic playing. Way to go, man. That was really great. I was very impressed by your right hand. That's what I was going to say too, Molly. The, that, that was about the best right hand technique I've seen. That's perfect, beautiful, uh, straight wrist, all those fingers moving from the big knuckle, very relaxed looking. Yeah, nicely done, man. And I loved your cadenza at the end. The, the, uh, was that improvised? Yeah, that was. Uh, I, I did put some thought into it. 
but uh, for the most part, it was just how, how it came out. Bravo. Yeah. So, Andrew, do you have a question for Molly? What would you like to talk about with Molly? What's it like to have a professional career in music? You know, I, it's, as a kid, it's like, this is all I wanted to do always. And um, the truth is, I think it's like any, I don't know. I mean, I only know my own career and I feel incredibly grateful. I love what I do every day. And I don't think most people have that. And I feel very fortunate to, to do something every day that I'm so passionate about, whether it's like getting to work with students that are inspiring, playing music that's inspiring, going out and performing. It really is a dream, but it is a roller coaster. I do have to say that it, like doing something you love so much makes you pretty vulnerable. Uh, so there's definitely rough days where, where there's a lot of self doubt. Um, but as a whole, definitely the, the good outweighs the rough days because to, to wake up and be obsessed with the thing you do and love it so deeply and be excited about, you know, every day is a, is a gift. Molly, I really like um, the idea that doing what you love makes you vulnerable. That's beautifully said. Thank you. If we, if we were a magazine, that would be the thing that was in bold quotes. Nicely said. And uh, uh, Andrew, anything else you want to add? What was the, the first endorsement that you ever got? Man, the first endorsement? Well, actually two things. When I was like 11, I got a free Daisy Rock guitar. No, maybe I was like 13 because it was one of those like my guitar teacher's friends for, you know, and it, so that was like my first unofficial endorsement. But it was really a few years ago, I started working with a lot of guitar companies and pedal companies. I think Gibson was one, an early endorsement. Um, I start when I was touring with Jason, they would, they loan, they lend me guitars because I have a vintage instrument, so I don't want to tour with mine. That was an early endorsement. That's one of them right behind me. I tour a lot with them. My newest endorsement, I just uh, got a heritage guitar a couple days ago. Lots of, yeah, it just happened really naturally. But I think, I think Gibson was the first one where I started getting endorsed and then, yeah, but it really is all about relationships. That's what I always say, whether it be like getting endorsed or getting gigs, it's all about building that community. Yeah, that's exciting stuff too, to get your first endorsement. That's a good question, Andrew. So yeah. Andrew, thank you so much. Thanks for offering that video to us and, and to sh for showing us your, your really excellent playing. And I'll, I'll be looking, so what's your, uh, what grade are you in in high school? I'm in my junior year. Junior year, okay, great. Are you thinking of the of, of becoming a musician professionally? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see you out there. Please, I, I want to see your videos all over the world and see, I guess well, I'm saying videos because we're in quarantine right now, but post-quarantine, I can't wait to hear you perform. Thank you. Me too, Andrew, way to go. So uh, um, we'll now uh, listen to our next soloist. Uh, this is gonna be Molly Sparhawk. She goes to uh, uh, Carbondale Middle School in Carbondale, Colorado, and she's going to be playing Leyenda from Lead Guitar Method Book One. Let's roll Molly. <laughs> What great playing, way to go. That piece is hard with all the string skipping. You did such a great job and you're like, weren't even looking at your instrument, great job. One of the things that really stuck out to me were the dynamics. You know, the, uh, most young guitarists don't get that and your ability to go from piano at the beginning to forte at the end, it really makes that piece expressive. I like that. So Molly, I bet you've got a question for, for Dr. Miller. So what made you want to play and what inspires you? Mm. Good questions. Um, what made me want to play? Honestly, how old are you, Molly? I'm um, 12. 
Oh, cool. So when I was seven years old, I'm in the middle of five kids. I'm so I've an older brother and sister and a younger brother and sister. When I was seven, my 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 parents were like, "Hey, you guys are gonna be in a family band, and Molly, you're gonna play guitar." I was like, "Okay." And that's how I started playing guitar. And so every day I, I grew up playing music with my siblings. And it just, it wasn't even like something I, I, I asked for. I feel so fortunate. My parents were like, this is what you're doing. And it, it really stuck, obviously. I fell in love with it. Um, what inspires me is really other people and other players. That's been one of the hardest things about COVID for me is I normally am out, even when I'm on tour uh, or when I have just gigs in LA, I'm out every night seeing seeing other musicians and not necessarily at like big crazy shows, but just my friends play around town all the time. So listening, hearing my friends play music and hearing people I, I love play music is really my, my fuel. What inspires you? Probably like, I just want to be the best guitar player I can be because I don't like to fail and I really like to succeed. And um, so I like to be, I like to try and like work my hardest so that I can have that good feeling of that I succeeded in something. I can relate, yeah. Molly, that not not liking to fail, being a perfectionist, I think is one of the the big determining factors in whether or not you can be successful as a musician, because you've got to have that, because we never play anything perfect, do we? There's, there's always a flaw. So, but it's that perfectionist in you that drives you to always get better and better. All right, well, so Molly, we'll say goodbye to you, and uh, we'll see you again soon. And Molly Miller, um, thank you so much for being our guest. Um, every, everybody else gets to see you in just a few minutes as we do, when we roll our play-along video, and you've already given us that video uh, to combine with all the kids. That's going to be cool, but th thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now it's time to welcome our friend Dennis Azabagic for our mini master class. Guitarist, if you haven't already, grab your guitar. Dennis, how are you? I'm doing very well. Glad to be here once again and do this show with you, Brad. So uh, t tell me again, what, is, what exactly are we going to work on today? Today I wanted to share a few tips on strumming the chords, on a technique of strumming the chords. What are the things we can pay attention to enhance our uh, strumming when it comes to playing uh, chords in chord progressions in the song? So one thing that I want to point out, which is very common uh, when we first strum the chords, is to use our forearm in sort of like a very large motion that swings all the way from, from our elbow in an up and down uh, sort of fashion, right? Like a lever, it goes up and down. And what I have found in many students that when you're doing that, you are displacing your hand too far out below the strings or above them. So instead of using that motion, or at least you can minimize that motion, but add another one, which is rotating your forearm from the elbow. So not going up and down, but rotating in this way. And um, my image in my head uh, about it is that I always remember this little toy, which is like a little drum that has these uh, little balls tied on each end. And when you are like a spinning it, when you're rotating it very fast, those balls hit it so quickly, right? So that's the same thing that I want to achieve with my, with my forearm, that it spins very quickly. So when I, when I strum, I can do it very, very quickly, right? So that's much more efficient and quicker than this up and down motion. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, I think of that motion, Dennis, as the motion of turning a doorknob, this rotating from the wrist, uh, which is a good way to remember that, I think. Absolutely, not only that, but you know, when, when you're talking about motion that it's already familiar to us from like everyday life, right? You know, everybody knows how to turn the knob. So just use your body, use the tactile memory, the tactile sense to imagine that, so then rotate it like that, like if you're going to, you know, the door doesn't want to open, but you're rotating anyways, right? And now switch the doorknob into this sort of thing, like a little, uh, like if you're picking up a paper or a pick actually, right? So now we're going to use our index finger as a pick. So when I'm rotating downwards, make sure that you have an angle on the string that is about a 45 degree angle, not very perpendicular because you're going to get stuck going like that. It sounds too harsh. But if you add that 45 degree angle on the way down and on the way up, 
the finger sort of like a gently brushes off the strings and you are not getting struck and you can really play it with much more of a ease. And one more thing, if you are um, into developing further your guitar technique and these strumming patterns, check out flamenco players because there you will really see what they can do with that rotating motion and combinations of all fingers. Uh, developing into tremendous variety of what we call um, our rasgado technique. Something like that. Oh, sweet. That sounded good. Dennis, thank you. That's fantastic advice. And, and I noticed you were playing the chord progression from making it up there. Well, I wish I would uh, take a credit and say that I made it up. But no, it was, it was already <laughs> made up by <laughs> Jason Mraz. And I'm glad to have our guest today to show us more about this song. All right, see you next time, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, it's time for the moment that so many of our students at home have been waiting for. This is our virtual ensemble. We're going to be performing Making It Up by Jason Mraz, and Molly Miller and lead guitar students from all over the country have made videos of themselves playing a part in the ensemble, which you'll see in the play along video coming up. The video has scrolling sheet music, which includes chords and a very easy ensemble part for those of you who would like to sight read with us. If you'd like to try to take a deeper dive into one of the more difficult parts, you can hit pause and go to leadguitar.org where you'll find scores and practice videos by clicking the We Are Guitar navigation under events. So let me grab a guitar and let's go over some of the things that will help you, uh, if you're winging it, just uh, swing right through the song. So we've got four chords in the song. We're in the key of G major. The first chord is G major. D major, E minor, and C major. So there's only one exception to that chord sequence. It cycles throughout the entire song, and that is in the chorus, we replace one measure of E minor with E major. And there's your E major chord. So thinking of rhythm and meter, we're in 4-4 time and each chord that you play is gonna last for one entire measure. So I think the most difficult part about this song is that it's played with a swing rhythm. If you're playing the chords, you don't really need to worry about that, but the melody parts do. So that's really tough to sight read. So instead of putting one of those on the scrolling screen, we've made this very simple sight readable part. It goes just simply like this. Just like that. So uh, that's easy enough to read through and that repeats quite a bit in the song too. So I think that's all you, all you need to really be able to play along successfully. So uh, Robbie, when you're ready, let's roll that film and uh, enjoy playing along. Here we go.
Well, I just loved seeing that, and I hope that was fun for our lead guitar students. There, there are so many of them that participated this time, and how cool it is to get to play with a rock star. I, 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 that's something that I'd remember forever when I was a kid if I got to do that. But um, So for those of you just listening, uh, watching at home, remember, if you'd like to check out ensemble parts and practice videos ahead of time for the next broadcast, keep an eye on the We Are Guitar page at leadguitar.org. You'll also find sheet music there for some of the solos you hear on the broadcasts. Our next show features composer and guitarist Carlos Rafael Rivera, whose work includes the scores for the Netflix series Godless and the Queen's Gambit. We'll be playing an arrangement of a piece by Carlos called Cancion, which was written originally for solo guitar, but we've turned it into an ensemble piece. And uh, thanks so much for all of you students who submitted a video and to all of you for tuning in and playing along at home. Um, I hope you had fun, too. We'll close the show now with a message from Tim McClotchick, CEO and founder of Guitar Salon International and the Cordoba Music Group and a lead guitar board member. Wow, Brad. Thanks very much. Thanks for your kind words. Well, thank all of you for watching and really glad to have you uh, participating as listeners and viewers. Um, I'm so proud of all the players, all the students, and uh, for their performance uh, today. I also want to thank the teachers for their excellent uh, work and very hard work during these extremely difficult times. Uh, from all of us at the GSI Foundation, thank you very much for your support for our foundation and, and to lead guitar. And uh, we wish you all the best during the holidays and I you know, hope you'll come back to see our next performance. Thank you very much. Bye.